Welcome to the Peterson's Bow Hunting Podcast. All bow hunting, all the time. Now, here's your host, Editor Christian Berg. All right, welcome to the Bow Hunting Podcast, brought to you by Lancaster Archery Supply. For all your bow hunting needs, visit LancasterArchery.com. They've got the gear, they've got the knowledge, they've got the passion. And as I always like to say, speaking of passion, we have today's guest, one of the most passionate deer hunters that I know, and certainly the most passionate one sticker I know. That's Mr. Greg Staggs, host of the popular YouTube channel Staggs in the Wild. How you doing, buddy? I'm good, Christian. How are you doing? Good. How was that introduction? All right for you? Dude, you killed it. I mean, I'm like, oh my gosh, now I got a lot to live up to. Well, I mean, you did tell me the other day, I mean, not to not to pump your tires too much, but, you know, you have single-handedly introduced, like, more people to one-sticking than anyone in the history of man, or something <laughs> oh, like that. I don't know. We, we've helped quite a few people. I don't know if it's uh, single-handedly like, more than anybody, but but we've helped our fair share, that's for sure. No, for sure. And And, you know, all joking aside, to be quite serious, you have quite a few videos i think 18 and counting on a playlist on your channel instructional videos everything from a basic overview on how to one stick to a uh, gear selection to some specific product reviews um so there's a lot there and you know we'll probably touch on a, a number of those things in today's episode but really just to get started why don't we back up and say this one sticking, okay? I, I guess it's no secret that mobile bow hunting is all the rage these days, right? Guys want to go lighter, they want to go deeper, and one sticking, while I'm sure it's not new, I mean, you'd know better than I just how long that that's been around. It's probably been around a lot longer than most people realize, but certainly as a mainstream tactic, this is a relatively recent phenomenon of like lots and lots of people wanting to do this, right, Greg? I would say so. I mean, it's been around for several years, but I would say about uh, probably sometime in the last the time span of three years, last three years, it's really took hold. And and literally, if you get on any of the Facebook groups that have anything to do with mobile hunting today, I mean, it's it's a well known tactic. I mean, it, you can't ask a question without someone throwing it out there as an option of a way to, to ascend a tree or, or or to get into a tree to hunt. So uh, it, it's probably one of the more popular ones out there. I mean, it's right there with climbers and and hang-ons and sticks and everything. It's, it's, it's got its place right there with them. Well, you know, it, it's funny because, I mean... I don't I guess maybe you could you could one stick with a hang on and and use a regular like hunter safety system and go up with a lineman's belt and turn around. But generally speaking, we're really talking about saddle hunting when we talk about one sticking, aren't we? We are. That's where it really shines. I've got a buddy of mine who who has kind of formed a hybrid system where he actually pulls up a, a hang on with him after he one sticks up and and it's more so because he's looking for more comfort once he's up there and, and he just, you know, he, he he was just trying to find his own way. But but for the most part, there's very few people that do that. For the most part, you know, I've got a video on my channel of, you know, can you go in and, and hunt it with less than 10 pounds? And I weighed out every single piece of my gear, including my saddle, every piece that it takes to one stick. And I think I came in at about 8.84 pounds, somewhere in through there. That's the only exception is I wasn't carrying my bow. But everything else, and and so a saddle is a great part of the one sticking one sticking gear uh, it, it, of your kit, if you will. Um, so so it, it just goes hand in hand. Saddle, one sticking, mobile hunting, all that makes it really easy and real nice. So so what to me, you know, if that being the case, and and you know, I speak from experience here. I think actually you do too. You know, I think most of us who saddle hunt today at one time were one of those guys who looked at somebody in a saddle and said to ourselves, that is, you know, looks really weird. I'm never getting in one of those. I'm never wearing a tree diaper, blah, 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 blah. Yep. And, you know, of course, now the last three seasons, I've done way more saddle hunting than I have spent time in a tree stand of any kind. Right. Um, so, and, and the thing is, what is, 
what do they always say about saddle hunting is that it they don't think it's going to be comfortable and then invariably like 90 some percent of everybody when they get in a saddle you go to one of these shows you've been a lot of the expos greg i know you've helped out at manufacturer booths it's probably the most common thing that people say when they first get into a saddle is what it's way more comfortable than i thought it was going to be right yeah number one response is oh my god i can't believe that this is as comfortable as it is yeah and you know a lot of times you're right i've helped out a lot of those booths and and some of those some of those shows i've just sat in the saddle you know tethered in on a pole a demonstration pole and watch people walk by and talk to them and just you know converse with them as they're walking by and and a lot of times people, you know, laugh at it, you know, it's like, that can't be comfy. I'm like, I've been sitting here for four or five, six hours, uh, you know, and, and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't comfortable. And and that's the thing, you know, I'm not sponsored by anybody in the industry. I'm not paid to promote a certain product. I'm not, you know, I'll just be very candid with you. If if there was a better way, I mean, I've gravitated. This has been a progression, a transition for me over 33 years of mobile hunting that I've been at this. Uh, I bought my first bow and started mobile hunting in 1990 as a college sophomore. And if 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 it wasn't comfortable, I wouldn't be doing it. I'm not I'm not paid to do it. I certainly wouldn't be putting myself through torture to to hunt a certain way that didn't fit me. That that wasn't good. That that you know was was terrible. Well, and well so, you you are a selfish bastard. You only want to do what works best for you. <laughs> you're you're not you're not interested in like just selling somebody something to make a quick buck. Yeah, exactly. I mean, literally, I, I have no affiliation with any product out there whatsoever. Not on any process in the industry. Nothing. So, uh, yeah, if, if I if if this didn't work for me personally, I sure as heck wouldn't be doing it. I'd be back in a. I mean, I hunted out of a lone wolf hand climber for almost twenty years. Killed a ton of deer out of it. Nothing wrong with lone wolf hand climber at all. I mean, I I, I didn't sell them just because I love them so much. Um, you know, it, I've, I've done four sticks and a hang on. I've done screw in steps. I've done everything. In fact, I still probably own every method back back in my archery room. Oh, yeah. But every day when I, when I choose to go hunting, I pick up my one stick and, and throw on a saddle and walk into the woods with it. Like I said, I, I walk in less than 10 pounds. It's pretty cool. Well, listen, I don't want to get off on a big tangent, but you talk, you know, you mentioned you're getting into this in the 90s and you mentioned your, your lone wolf climber. I immediately thought of my, I have two summit climbers in the mm-hmm. garage and you know i've killed quite a few animals out of those stands over the years and i have to say probably much like you i haven't hardly taken them out the last handful of years but i don't have any desire to get rid of them per se and i was just curious when you first got into mobile hunting what was your very first climber did you have an old man or something like that so my first one was probably old man was probably in existence. Uh, there was a, a catalog like cheaper than dirt or something like that. It was the yeah the yeah catalog. yeah yeah. So my parents got one of those and I was thumbing through it and I ordered a climber out of it and it probably cost more to ship it to me than the climber cost because it was 100% steel. I mean the thing probably weighed 35 pounds and it had the old V bar. So you, you had wee nuts on each side of the V bar and so whichever side you wanted to unscrew, then you'd scissor it over, slap it around. And it had a series of holes in it, and you put those wee nuts back in it, and that's how you adjusted your angle to get up in it. But it, it was rickety, it creaked. I remember I was hanging down in Alabama one one time with it, and and I had a little buck coming in by today's standard. He was very small for me, but back then I was super excited about him. Uh, he was trailing a doe, and the doe walked by, and I shifted my feet to turn to get into to rank, you know, position to, to draw on him. And when I shifted, I went eek, and popped. And the buck jumped sideways and jumped out of range and behind some trees. And, you know, again, the great thing about saddles today, you don't have to worry about creaking and popping and metal clicking and rivets and things like that. But, yeah, that that was uh, that was my first thing. It was a no-name steel D-bar climber that I bought from uh, some magazine like Cheaper Than Dirt. Well, you know what? It served its purpose, which was to move you one more rung on the ladder of, of exactly. bow hunting. And, you know, now you're on this one sticking rung. And, I, you know, I want to go back to what I said about when people first get into a saddle and kind of being surprised about how much more comfortable it is than they may be expected. Because I think that's a mental hurdle that people have to get over to ever sort of even be willing to give it a try. And, 
you know, as somebody who's never one sticked himself, I feel like I'm back at the same place where I'm standing on the front side of the hurdle and I'm not on the back side where you are yet because I'm thinking, man, I don't know if I could really just go out there with just one stick. Literally, you don't even carry a saddle platform. We talked about this because, no. you know, I, I do want to mention for those who haven't seen it, um, you're going to want to make sure to get a copy of our July issue because Greg's got a whole article in there about one sticking and we're working on that issue right now and it'll be out uh, in early June. But we were talking about a variety of things as I was editing your article and doing a little bit of follow up like so you've got it. I think it's actually maybe on the floor behind you. I think I can see it leaning there. It's basically a climbing stick that's modified or custom built where you've got uh, some steps on the bottom and, and a real sort of a mini saddle platform on the top. Yeah, so this, uh, for the people who are able to watch the video of this podcast, uh, this is it, it's 12 inches in total length. This is uh, offered through Eastern Woods Outdoors. You can find them at easternwoodsoutdoors.com or doublesteps.com. Both, both URLs will lead you to the same domain, same website. But it's a 12 inch stick uh, called their Ultimate One Stick. Uh, it has a, uh, this is a pack and play, and inside of it is the Ultimator. John Richards developed uh, the Ultimator. It's really cool. It's completely custom customizable. You can adjust the length, the, the number of steps, whatever you want. So you only have to buy one aider. doesn't matter how tall you are, what your stride length is, what's, what your distance from your knee to your, to your heel is. Uh, one Ultimator will, will fit you as soon as you adjust it. Um, then we have on this one, this was probably a Schaefer cam cleat. Schaefer cam cleats and Harkin 150s are pretty much interchangeable. It depends on which one you can you, you get. Uh, they both serve the same purpose. They're basically from the sailing industry. It's just uh, it, it allows you to grab your rope right there and pull it through. And that's important as we get into it. We'll, we'll probably discuss a little bit of the techniques of one second. I, I, I was going to say, I'm going to probably slow you down because you to you, everything you just said is nothing. But yeah. Two things. One, you have to realize that the vast majority of our audience is streaming audio only. So even yep. though we put the video on YouTube, most of our consumption is through Apple Podcasts and Stitcher and Spotify and, and platforms like that. So somebody's probably driving in their truck right now and they just heard you mention a whole bunch of gear that, that you know, maybe it didn't mean anything to them. So let me do this and I'm going to have you walk through it real slow, like for idiots like me and other people who haven't been doing this, like, because I think you said how many last few seasons, how many one set sets a year are you putting in now? Well, I, I have put in an average of over 100 sits a year for over 25 years. And so for the last, you know, several years that I've been one sticking, you know, I'm going up and down a tree over 100 times with, with a one stick, not counting the demos and shows and explanations and people that, you know, meet me out somewhere and say, hey, I'd like to meet, meet up with you and see how this works. I mean, in addition to all of those one on one demonstrations and things like that. So yeah, it's uh, I probably went up and down a tree with a one stick and rappelled down, and we'll get into that probably over a thousand times since I've begun one sticking because of uh, how much I get to hunt. I'm I'm very blessed in that, but yeah. So so, uh, so so does practice make perfect, or does it just make pretty darn good? You know, it it's the you know perfect practice makes perfect. You know, you need to practice the right way. Uh, if you practice the wrong things all the time, you'll be wrong. You'll be wrong really well. So, uh, but yeah, it, practice is very important. And, and we talk about that a lot on the forums and the boards where, where saddle hunters gather together to converse, you know, on Facebook and different forums is that a lot of people get their gear, they buy their gear. And the first time they go up a tree with it is the first time they hunt. And then you'll see them come back to a forum or a message board and they're like, wow, today was a cluster. I'm like, we're like, really? You're surprised? I mean, you've had all summer that you've had this gear and you haven't practiced with it. So practice is a very important ingredient in it. So yeah, that actually brings up a great point because you know somebody might think, well, why are we doing a one sticking uh, podcast in turkey season? But the fact of the matter is, you know, we're gonna be uh, into the perfect time of year to get equipment. Uh, sort of tinker with it if you like to customize it and have plenty of time to practice before opening day. And if you take everything that Greg talks about in today's episode and start putting this into practice, you're going to be like a well-oiled machine by opening day. And, and yeah, then you're going to get up into the tree and you're not going to be completely flustered 
half worn out. You know, you won't have made, you know, the sound of a rock concert getting yourself up the tree and you actually may have a chance of, you know, punching a tag. So let's go back up and talk about your stick again. So obviously with one stick, we'll we'll get into the climbing methods, but I really want to get into the basic equipment here. And again, we're going to start with that stick. And Greg, one thing that you really stressed in your article, traditionally, you know, climbing sticks, they could be pretty long, you know, 30 some inches was common at one time. Today, you said uh, like 15 to 7 inches or quite 15 to 17 inches is quite popular, but you really prefer a 12 inch stick. Talk to me about stick length and why that matters so much to you. Yeah, so so if, if for those who can't see what I'm holding, I'm holding my, my one stick here. So you think of a, a traditional climbing stick, and, and again, you're right, they used to be 30 inches, somewhere in that neighborhood. And then over the years, we've kind of gravitated to, you know, a 17 to a 19 to some maybe a 21 inch stick. And people have started pairing those with aiders because it's easier to roll up or pack an aider. And an aider is a nylon webbing piece that attaches to your bottom step with rungs like a ladder, like a fireman would use, or an escape route that you would throw out your bedroom window if you're on a two-story house or something like that. Yeah, it's basically a rope ladder made out of nylon webbing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So so people started cutting down sticks and manufacturers followed suit and started manufacturing smaller or shorter sticks rather, not smaller, but shorter, which did in turn make them smaller, but shorter sticks. So with a one stick, we've even taken that drastically a step more. And the, the most popular sizes or lengths of a one stick is 12 or 15. Some 18 inch sticks are sold, but what we found is those are bulky and cumbersome when it comes to one sticking. I prefer a 12 inch, pretty much the shortest you can get. If, if they made a 10 inch, I'd probably use that. But, but 12 inch is really right in my wheelhouse because I found out that when I'm climbing, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here, Christian, when you make your move, when you when you 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 basically go up a big move at a time, when you're putting your head, your your stick above your head, you climb up it, you 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 you're tethered in, you reach out and grab your stick and you put it back above your head. Those are moves. Your moves comes from your gains, rather, your gains in, in climbing height come from those moves, not the length of your stick. A lot of people think, well, gosh, I could get a lot higher with an 18-inch stick or a 15-inch stick. Not necessarily. You're only going to get up two or three inches more than I would at best. And I'd rather take this one, this little bitty 12-inch stick that I can completely control. It packs better. I don't have to worry about branches. I actually hunted the last week of the season on a 15-inch stick. I was testing another manufacturer's stick for them and doing a review over it for my channel. And they sent me a 15-inch stick. Well, I'm used to a 12 inch stick and I could drastically tell that extra length, especially when I was going up a limbed tree and I was climbing on one of my hunts because I put it on the tree and the top and the bottom wouldn't fit between a couple limbs. And I, I was just a couple inches, I needed a, just a couple inches stick, shorter stick to fit it in between those limbs. I had to go yeah, around the you. back side of the tree to keep going. So, so basically, you know, it's not that there's a right or wrong answer per se, right. but experience has shown you you're not giving up much, if anything, in the climbing ability with the shorter stick, but you are gaining a lot of versatility on the tree because of situations that you just mentioned. And it's also just more compact to put it on the back of your pack to yep. walk in. It's a little bit lighter, et cetera. So, and now when you talk about a 12 inch stick, are you talking about the post itself is 12 inches long, right? Correct. Yes. Yes. The actual length of stick. So, but so, the way that this one is built, the, the step is secured above the bottom of the post. And then this top platform that's bolted to it is probably about a quarter of an inch thick. So this total length of the stick might be 12 and a quarter inch. It is a true 12 inch stick. It's and, really small. And people are going to want to know, of course, uh, what does Greg like to use? So uh, for those who are interested, you use uh, right there, it's called the Ultimate One Stick, right, from Eastern Woods Outdoors. That's and correct. if you go to their website, you can buy different lengths of sticks and you can customize those. They offer some different step options for the top and bottom. You know, you can get one 
with two sets of steps. You can get one like yours with a step and a platform. So there, there is some customization that goes in there, but yours is probably at least pretty similar to what most people use, correct? It is, and I get this question a lot. I have a lot of people DM me or PM me on Facebook and say, hey, I'm thinking about using a separate platform in addition to my stick. Would you just recommend a little 12-inch stick with two sets of steps, not the top platform? And I always tell them, I'm like, you know what? If it was me, I would go ahead and get at least some sort of little platform. It may not, this is one of the largest platforms that's made. It's called the Ultimate Platform, the UP, and it goes on the Ultimate Stick. Um, but the UP is probably the largest one. You don't have to get one quite as large as this, but I would get some sort of little platform and not a top step because what if you don't want to take your platform in that day? And so you can go ahead and hunt off of it because it's really not, it's not the best to hunt off of a step on the, on the top. It, it can become uncomfortable, especially if you don't have stiff sole boots like Krispies or Kinetrex or something of those, a, a really nice stiff sole. So the, the having a platform really helps if you decide not to take take a take a separate additional platform in. It also gives you a nice place to stand while you're making your moves and moving your tether up the tree so that you can go ahead and make another move. So those are the two biggest reasons I, I recommend having some sort of platform on your stick. Yeah, I agree with I agree with that, Greg, because I have, even though I don't want stick, I have gone in, you know, just to do like afternoon saddle hunts. And so you're only you're only going to be in the tree for like three hours. And I'm just like, I'm not going to take my platform today. I'll just stand on the, the top rung. And like you said, I mean, it's doable for a few hours, but it really isn't anywhere near as comfortable as having a little bit bigger of a surface to rest your feet on. Yeah. And you'll see for, for those who can't see on, on the video screen. So this, I, I'm a, what's called a leaner. Most saddle, saddle people, saddle hunters, this, they fall into two different categories. They're either a sitter where they're actually sitting with their knees almost at a 90 degree angle, like you'd be sitting in a chair, or you lean so that your whole body is straight, but you're at about a 35 to 40 degree angle from the tree. I'm more of a leaner. And so my platform on top of my stick is angled so that it accommodates that leaning preference that I have. They also make these platforms completely solidly straight. So if you're more of a sitter, you've got all that surface area to rest your feet upon because your your feet are going to be straight because you're in a that 90 degree configuration like you're sitting in a chair. Yeah, that that those angled edges are getting more popular, you know, on the saddle platforms. Like, you know, for people who are can't see you right now, but maybe are familiar with saddle gear, you know, trophy line came out with a new platform at ATA, the Onyx, that has, mm -hmm. you know, angled edges. So that's something that you're seeing more and more in the saddle hunting world. Okay, so you've got this stick. It's got on the bottom, it's got a pretty standard double step, okay, which means, you know, there's one piece of aluminum. It's got, you know, a step on either side of the stick. Then to that step, he has attached, what did you call that thing? A play pen? So this is a play pack, a pack and play, rather, pack and play. So, <laughs> pack so, uh, and play, yeah, pack and play. That's what, that's what we put our toddlers in. Yeah, you got me thinking back uh, about 15 to 18 years ago when I had kids. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to undo it. The pack and play, really all it does is it holds the ultimator, and you'll see the, the ultimator fall out, and it, this aider. It, so it, it's just a nice way to pack up the ultimator and uh, keeps it all all yeah. in one little so, so I'm going to describe this again for people who can't see it. So the the aider itself, I mean, gosh, that thing probably only weighs about seven eight ounces tops. Probably. And and so it's literally just like we described. You know, I mean, I think you can picture that. It's a rope ladder, and there's uh, some stiff, like maybe plastic or rubber material in the step sections, which helps to hope the ladder holds itself open so you can get your boot in there as you're climbing up the tree. But basically, you know, you could just imagine taking just some nylon webbing, you could sort of crumple that up and hold it in the palm of your hand. Well, that's basically all Greg does. He just kind of like gathers it up. He's got a piece of fabric, which he calls his pack and play. It's just a piece of camouflage fabric uh, that essentially clips up around the bottom step of his stick. So it holds that aider completely compact, secure, out of the way. It's not going to get tangled on, you know, brush and branches and things as you're walking in. Once you get to the tree, you're ready to set up. You just lower that down, put your lift your stick up and you're ready to put it on. So that's the bottom of a stick. Now let's move up to the center. 
uh, I say about two thirds of the way up, you talked about your cleat. The cam cleat is very important. Cam cleat is basically a spring loaded cleat. And like you said, this is just a little piece of hardware, nothing super fancy or earth shattering about it in and of itself. But mounting it on a climbing stick is, you know, something that you don't see every day. And the reason that you really need that when one sticking is because without it, you know, I mean, I think about I, I just use um uh um like daisy chain am steel, you know, it's, it's got a bunch of versa button. Yeah. And it just, you know, and it's got a, a series of loops woven into the, the amp steel. And I just stick it on the tree with one hand, pull my my rope around with the other hand and whichever is the closest, you know, loop that fits. I put it over the button and just push it down to. to but you want to be able to do a lot of your work when you're one sticking with one hand. And this cam cleat allows you to do that. Correct. So when I'm, I'm hanging there and we'll get into that, because really the only difference because as much as we're going into gear and describing different pieces and different attributes of this, really the only difference in one sticking and climbing four sticks is once I get to the top of this stick, I literally hang there, reach down and grab it and move it up. That's the only difference. If you want to boil it down to its most simplistic form, that's all I'm doing different is I'm hanging by my tether, which you should be tethered in or at the least a lineman belt going around you. But a lot of people don't really like a lineman belt because it still allows you to fall down the tree. It just allows you to fall down and scrape your front a lot but harder. But so if the ideal way would be to move your tether up as you're climbing up with four sticks. Well, I don't have to take a second, third, and a fourth stick up. I just hang there, reach down, grab my stick. But it's you can you can get a get a lot more gain, you can get a lot more ground gain by reaching down with one hand and kind of pivoting and grabbing it with one stick with one hand. And but I'm that one hand operation is really a lot easier to slip this rope out that's holding the stick and grab it and pull it up. Because because with that cam cleat to get the rope out, all you kind of got to do is pull on it and and like then pull out and it'll come right out. You literally just pull it out. Now what I've learned to do over the years of doing this and how many climbs I've got, as you mentioned. You can, in fact, that was one of the questions when new people look at one second, they go, well, that that noise of pulling the rope out of the cleat, you can hear it there, is kind yeah, of Do loud. it again. Let's be quiet. Do it again. Yeah. There you go. It, it makes a tinging sound, right? Yeah. Well, what I learn to do is I, I don't, because a lot of people will, will use a grab handle like this that, that pulls out, and they'll, they'll climb as high as they can. They reach way down. They can barely grab their stick with this, and they... They just they grab the rope and pull it out. Well, I've learned not to climb just quite so high. I'll climb up and reach down with my hands and ease this stick, ease the rope out of the cam cleat and allow the cam cleats to close back with my hand in between them. I'll ease them back into place as opposed to allowing it just to pop. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Okay, so I think we've described the stick now. So you've got, you know, I don't want to overcomplicate it. Like we talked about it for a while, but I think people get it. Like you said, it's not, it's not all that different, but it's a, it is modified. It's a stick with steps on the bottom, a little platform on the top. And that cam cleat is there instead of a button or a little, you know, like think about the tethered one stick has that little metal plate with four grooves where you do right. the, you know, you wind the M steel around it. So there's different ways with different sticks. But again, this is something that really is going to help you out if your goal is one sticking. So, okay, right. so we described your stick. And now what about your saddle? Again, you said it's not that much different than any other. So, I mean, you don't need, if I like, like I already have a couple different saddles. If somebody already has a saddle, they don't need to buy a whole bunch of new stuff to no. one stick, do they? No, they, they don't. I, I've used the same saddle that I hunted with previously before. So, uh, um, yeah, there are people. I get this question a lot of times. Do you have to have a, a single panel saddle? Can you one stick with a double panel, a two panel saddle, like a buzzard roost or latitude makes a, a two panel saddle. There's others. I think cruiser makes an archon. And so there, there's different ones out there. But, yeah, I, I've got friends that one stick in one or two panel saddles. It, it doesn't matter. Now. Obviously, you will need some stuff uh, for the rappelling, but maybe we'll just save that and get into that. Uh, well, that's the most fun part. Yeah, when you start climbing. So, okay, so talk to me. You've got your saddle. 
um, why don't we just do this? You've you've parked your truck and you're standing there at the truck and you're getting ready to head into the woods. Uh, walk me through your system, uh, getting ready to head out and then walk into your tree and setting up. Yeah, so the nice thing about it is I'm already packed before I when I load up. So I just grab I, I started using a little system where I've got a little bitty mini backpack and it holds my rope and it holds my carabiner and madrock and knee pads on another side that I can access without any zippers or anything else. They're in, in two separate pockets. And and my one stick is strapped to that via a couple uh dedicated lashing straps to it. So I literally can because well, if I'm driving there, my saddle's in the back of the truck or back of the car or whatever I'm in. I put my saddle on at the vehicle. Some guys keep it in the pack, and they don't put the saddle on until they're at the tree they want to hunt. My saddles, are, I mean, they're so light. They're so, I mean, you're talking two to three pounds, and, and they're super comfortable. Um, I, I It doesn't matter if I'm going to go in three-quarters of a mile, two miles. I, I wear my saddle in every hunt. I wear it out every hunt. So I don or I put on my saddle right there at the vehicle, grab my pack, throw it on, grab my bow, and I'm walking. And, and I can go into a predetermined tree. I can go in and, and scout my way in looking for a hot sign, which I often do. Uh, but then once I, once I find a place that I want to hunt, um, what I'll do is I, I lay my bow down on the ground. I take my, uh, I take my uh, pack off the back. I get the rappel rope out. I throw the rappel rope around the tree, which basically is going to be my tether on the way up. So my rappel rope and the tether rope is the exact same rope, and it's 40 foot long. So that becomes important because I can climb as high as I want to at that point. But I throw it around the tree, and I take my mad rock and a carabiner out, clip it onto the rope, and hook my bridge to that, and throw on the one stick on the tree, and I'm ready to go. So literally in a minute or two, I can be ready to climb the tree. Okay, so what's next, Greg? So at this point, I'm going to climb uh, climb up to, to the, using the aider at the bottom. I, I set the bottom rung of the aider about my knee high. That's a comfortable step for me. So I step up into the aider, another step. And when I step onto the bottom rung, the actual step of the one stick, so the first real step I get to, I pause there and take my tether which I put as high as I could when I first attached when I first got to the tree. I take it and slide it on up one more time, and I do that to minimize tether slack. It kind of became a big deal in the one sticking world. People started talking about well, when you're making these huge moves up a tree, moving five, six foot up at a time, you're introducing a lot of slack into your tether, which is true. There's no doubt about that. So I pause about midway through my climb and move my tether on up, so that way if a at the most point, if I ever accidentally fell for some reason, I wouldn't fall two or three foot and get yanked really hard. There's a there's fall factors that you can figure in there and everything. It can can really exacerbate or 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 really kind of uh, um, the 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 move the the fall can really hurt you really bad more so than you would think. So uh, I move my tether on up a little bit. As soon as I get it slid up, then I go ahead and climb to the top of my my one stick, move it up one more final time. At that point, I'm ready just to hang. Let my I let my legs go on either side of the tree. I typically climb about a volleyball to a beach beach ball sized tree, and I just let my legs go on either side of it. Hang, reach down, grab the stick, and I ease that rope out of the out of the cam plate, making sure that it doesn't ping as we talked about earlier. And just pull it up and reattach it up above my head and repeat the process. Climb up. Re, I can repeat that. If it's if there's if it's early in the hunting season, September 15th, September 20th in Missouri and Illinois, I, one or two moves is all I have to do, and I'm at 12 to 15 to 18 foot high with with a couple moves. That the foliage is to the point where I don't have to go way on up. Later in the season, when all the leaves have dropped, I'll make three to four moves, but it's the exact same way. That's the beauty of one sticking. You carry the same amount of gear in for different climbing heights, no matter how high you want to go. Okay, I got to ask you a couple of questions. First one, you get this all the time, I'm sure. Like, if it's if it's in the morning and the sun hasn't come up yet, is it hard to see your aider? Is it hard to get your feet in the aider? Is it hard to get your first step in there and get yourself up off the ground and 
you know, how long does it take to get used to that? And what tips do you have for using the aider? Because I think a lot of people, that's going to be the scariest part is that aider. Yeah. So, so the first part about, you actually have a two, two part question there. So the first part of your question there was seeing things in the dark and, and getting your feet placed properly in the dark and things like that. They came out with this tremendous uh, innovation, th this invention several years back that I use to my benefit, and it's called a flashlight. It is awesome. So so I actually wear one that has a strap <laughs> that goes around my head, and the little flashlight is on that, and some people call it a headlamp. And it is awesome because wherever I look, it shines light. And so if I look down to see where my foot is and where it needs to go on that aider, it shines the light right at my foot, and I can see what I'm doing. It's awesome. More guys ought to try it. So, well, obviously you're being a little sarcastic, but maybe maybe there are not a lot of a lot of guys don't want to use a light. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, so so yes, I'm being very sarcastic because that 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 discussion comes up a lot, and and it's my firm belief that there's a, there's a vast majority of diehard killers. You know, THP, Dan Insults, you you name it. You can go through the through the ranks there. That and I personally, you know, 33 years of going in a hundred times a year. Uh, back and forth, back and forth. I have put my flashlight on deer, not a, there's a lot of us who believe that lights don't spook deer going in and out of the woods. And so being able to, to, uh, to put in, that's white light. You're always going to have the contingent of people that believe you should use a red light or a green light or no light, moonlight only. I'll tell you what, you, you mentioned the fact that it was turkey season, right? My son and I tried to sneak in under a bird today to kill one this morning at 430 this morning. And it was cloudy, dark, no moonlight. And I, I actually thought of this discussion, even though we hadn't had it yet, but I thought of this concept as we were sneaking through the turkey woods trying to get close to that roosted bird. We were bumping into every branch. Every, we were making more noise without trying, with, trying to walk in there without a light than if we had just put a low light down. I mean, so, yeah, I, I'm a firm believer in using a flashlight in the woods. I think so, it makes you quieter yeah. and stealthier. So you're a big flashlight guy. And uh, yeah, just like uh, you know, Bill Winky, he's a big um, he's a big he gray like, light guy. Yeah, he likes yeah. he he says yeah he doesn't believe in getting in. He doesn't believe like you know the old you got to get in forty five minutes before sunlight to let the wood settle down. Yeah, you know he just says wait until you can just about see. Yeah. And and go in then because you don't have to use a flashlight and you can be quieter. Like you said, you can be quick and you can be quiet and just go get in. Yeah. 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 But I, I'm in the, of the camp. I firmly believe that flashlights do not spook deer. Uh, so so I'm of that camp. So I have I, when I go in early, I do go in early. Uh, it really kind of depends on, you know, are you hunting a destination source? Are you hunting a travel route? Are you hunting a bedding area? Are you trying to beat a buck to its bed? You know, there, there's different scenarios, but uh, I, I typically do like to, to be in early, let the wood settle just a bit. Uh, it doesn't have to be 15, 20 minutes, but a little bit. But so I, I use a flashlight to, to uh, when I go in dark in the, in the mornings. So what about, okay, so you answered that about how you see. Now, what about... The aiders was the yeah, second part of the question. Yeah, what about just using an aider? Is it tricky to get your boots in there? And do you feel secure when you're climbing in that? So, so a couple things in that there are aiders that are flimsier. They don't take the time to put the, like a rubber hose, like like you talked about, that that really fills out the step. It keeps the aider spread wide. It makes it really easy to find that step. Ultimator is one of the sturdiest. I mean, it's it's really good. And that's one of the reasons why I use it among a couple, three different other ones. But Ultimator has a really good sturdy step in there that makes it easy to put your foot on and find that place. So, so you want if it's not ultimator, find one that does make sure they have put a rubber hose or something in there that that holds that step rigid and makes it easy to find that step and it doesn't collapse on your foot. The ones that are just a webbing, just a piece of nylon, when you put your foot on there, it folds up around either side of your heat of your feet and and it's just not a comfortable climb. So that little piece of rigid rubber hose makes it really nice to to step on. And then more importantly, as far as comfort and safety aspect of it, you want, so there's two things. A lot of people don't realize the standoffs on your stick help tremendously with aider climbing. So the best standoffs in this, bar none, no one can argue it, the best standoffs in the industry are the 
the uh, Eastern Wood standoffs, the double step standoffs, they they put your they position your your stick farther away from the trunk of the tree. They give you they're they're almost five inches in length, and so that gives you a lot of room to stick your foot in there before, and you can put the middle of your foot on the rung, and and that's one of the reasons why I use that stick. And so you can get your whole foot in there, and then you want to dig your toe into the trunk of the tree. I always keep two points of attachment, two two arms, two whatever, and, and then dig your toe into the trunk of the tree. It makes it really safe as you're going up. So that's a key part of it. Yeah, I was thinking about it when I was editing your article. And, you know, I did eventually, like, it hit me because I've used, you know, enough climbing sticks. But when I was first thinking about the aider, I was thinking about exactly what you were talking about. Like, if that was hanging just right up against the bark of the tree, it'd be really, really hard to get that away to get any amount of your foot, your boot sole in there to get a grip. You know, you just barely have a toe in there. But the fact that your stick is sitting away from the tree means the aider is hanging down and there's enough room, there's enough of a gap between the trunk of the tree and that step in the aider ladder that you can stick your boot in there and get a good firm grip. And, and so that really would, you know, like I say, it would be hard to use an aider without that. Yeah, that's why standoff distance is so important. And there's so many discussions on the forums and the boards about standoff distance. And and I've been a big part of those discussions. And, and it's one reason that I'm such a fan of the Eastern Wood sticks is because the standoff height is so great. It's the best in the industry. There's There's nothing else. There's some other ones out there that are good. There's some that are horrible that you're basically climbing on your tiptoes and um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Eastern Wood sticks because of that sandal pipe. Gotcha. So the other question that I had, I'm trying to remember now, so I wanted to ask you about the Aider. Oh, yeah, I wanted to ask you, and you got to get this one all the time too. So what happens if slash when you drop your stick? Yeah. Well, you know what, believe it or not, it's not as common as you would think. I, I've seen some people do it. I've I've got probably close to a thousand climbs. I've never dropped my stick. There's two ways, two things you could do about it. I actually carry a little device that you open it up. It's spring activated. And uh, do you have one of those? I do. The little, the little called, claw, the claw thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's called the Booger Retriever. It's made by a company called Walnut Grove Products. Uh, it's phenomenal. I actually did a review on it on my channel. It's 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 been a huge hit. A ton of saddle hunters use it now. Uh, but I, I carry one of those, but really, even if you didn't carry one of those, here's the really simple thing. Even if you dropped your stick from, let's say 20 foot high, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't have one of those little claw devices. What do I do? Rappel down, get your stick and start over. It's that simple. Literally. Yeah. It, it, you know, and, and so I guess we're going to get to the rappel part of things now, but basically if just because you're only halfway up, let's say you were going to go up 20 feet and you're at 10 feet and you drop your stick, well, you're just going to do the same thing at that point that you were going to do three hours from now at the end of the yeah. hunt. And you're just going to have to start all over again when you get back down to the ground. And so right. this is, so let me set the stage for the rappelling with this because we didn't touch on it yet. And people, right. it won't make sense for you to start talking about rappelling unless I throw this in, which is that Greg's tether, most of us think of our tree tether, it's you know, not that long of a piece of rope. It goes around the tree and it feeds through a loop and there's a carabiner on a Prusik knot and we clip in. Greg's got a rope that's 40 feet long. So he's feeding the tag end of a, a 40 foot rope. And as he goes up the tree and he's sliding his tether up uh, above him, his tag end is going all the way down to the ground and that's how he's going to repel. So with, with that, I will let you take it from there. No, it's a, it's a great. So I actually, at the very end of that tag end of that 40 foot rope, I actually spliced a continuous loop of, of Dynaglide. It's, it's like a small, think of Amsteel. A lot of people are familiar with Amsteel. Dynaglide is a much smaller version of Amsteel. I spliced a little continuous loop and I have a video on my channel how to do that. And I slide that little loop over my stabilizer, run that rope through one of the cams of my bow. And I use the tag end of my rappel slash tether rope to to pull my bow up. I don't need a separate pull up rope, uh, another hoist rope. I use my tag end to pull my bow up that way. Uh, well, really one, one thing just to jump on that, Greg, is I, I like that idea because 
in addition to just simplifying things and the fact that you don't have to use a separate rope, the ropes that I use for pull up tend to be your thin paracord yes. or yeah. I have one of those hunter safety system reels, which is right. kind of nice, but it's got that ribbon that comes out, that fabric yep. ribbon. And again, it I, I like it, but it's so darn light and the wind blows it around. It gets blown right. into other branches. It gets tangled up and stuff. Your your tether rope is a good full size rope and it probably never gets tangled up. You know, it, it does. And it and it, I, I've, I've said this before. It's it's kind of hard to explain in 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 the written form on forms and stuff, but it, it is a very comfortable way to pull your rope up, meaning that you're holding a rope that's a lot more meatier. You know, we're using I'm using a, a 10 millimeter rope, which is probably roughly a, a half inch size in diameter, somewhere through there. And so you're you're feeding a half inch size rope through your hands to pull your rope up. As opposed to something that's maybe like a piece of paracord, you know, a sixteenth and an eighth of an inch, something like that, that you know gets to where if you're feeding it through really fast, it's you know you're kind of wearing on your hands a little bit. It can you know burn them a little bit if you're sliding it through really quickly. Sometimes you you need to make sure you've got gloves on when you're lowering your bow or something like that. I'm I'm doing the same thing with a half inch rope. It's a very comfortable way to bring your. You can also control it if because I climb a lot of limbed trees, a lot of trees with limbs in it. And I can maneuver it up and around very, very easily with that bigger rope and control my bow going up and down a lot easier. So that's just a one benefit of having that longer rope all in one system. Tether, rappel rope, and hoist rope is all one thing. That's really, really interesting. So, so getting more onto this rappelling thing. Now, here is where there is um, maybe a couple different pieces of equipment that you need. Um, Absolutely. Really, in terms of climbing hardware, right, Greg? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so I am a huge fan of the Madrock Safeguard, and what that is, it's a belay device. It's what mountaineering people use when they're going to climb cliffs or mountains or they're doing something like that. They will have a person below them on belay. That person is there holding and making sure that if they slip and fall, they can get the rope taut, and, and they use what's called a belay device. And so the, this device that I use, the Madrox Safeguard, is made for belaying climbers in the mountaineering industry. We kind of use it a little bit and assimilated it for our purposes. And so the nice thing about it is it can be an ascender with an A. Think of a, a Ropeman one or a Kong duck. Those are ascenders that a lot of people use when they're traditionally saddle hunting. And, and they kind of take the place of a prusik knot that you mentioned earlier. But the difference with a Madrox Safeguard is it's an ascender. It can it can tighten up rope like like a Ropeman one can or a Kong duck. But then it's got a handle off to the back side of it that I can grab with my left hand. And when I grab that handle, what it does, the handle actually pivots the device while it's on the rope. So the nice thing about it is it's not a spring action inside of it, although it does have a spring just to return the handle. The spring is, isn't doing anything to make the the uh, feeding the rope through any easier. The the what what makes the what feeds the rope through is when you grab the handle and pull the device, it turns the device at an angle that allows the rope to sl freely slip through with less friction. So it's just a friction device, which I like because there's nothing really that can fail in there uh, like a spring or something mechanical. So you grab the handle and turn the device, and the harder you pull the handle handle the more it turns the device. And so you can control the speed of the descent or how fast you repel by how hard you pull the handle, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So basically, if you pull hard, you go down fast. And if you pull softer, you go down slower. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, there are times I'm in a mood where, I don't know, maybe I'm not feeling it that day, whatever. Maybe it's icy conditions, it's cold. It's below freezing. I've sat for three or four hours. My limbs are really numb. My digits, my fingers are cold. I'm probably going to walk myself down the tree more like you remember seeing Adam West and, and Batman and Robin in the 1950s where they walk down a wall with that music going in the background. I'm probably going to come down the tree more like that, real safe and slow. There are other times when I am feeling it and I'm in a good mood and things are going well and I'm just in that mood. And I'm playing Navy SEAL special ops that day and one or two bounds and I hit the ground in about a half a second. Those are fun days. And it's, but it's your choice. It's whatever you want to do. Right. I, I'm not recommending jumping off like you're going out of a five story start story building. 
but you certainly can. You're, to your point, you control the rate of descent with that with a handle. That's when you get one of those texts from your wife and says she's missing you, and you yeah. get to the you're like one second and you're back on the ground. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, um, so okay, so I mean, yeah, we could probably talk along more just about rappelling, but I mean, it's really not that complicated. You're supported by your saddle, mm-hmm. and you can't fall because if your hand if your hand goes away from that belay device, you're just going to stop. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, and one thing I do want to throw out this way, I mentioned, I, I kind of preface it, emphasize the fact that I'm a fan of the Madrox Safeguard. Uh, it's what I personally use. There are other alternatives out there, and I show on my channel some options that people use. A lot of people use just a basic figure eight, and that's where you run your rappel rope through a kind of a, fig, a metal figure eight device, and how many loops you go around the figure eight device kind of controls how fast the rope can come through based on friction principles, right? So you can use non-mechanical methods to come down. And those those devices cost anywhere from, you know, $8 to $25 or $30. The Manrock Safeguard is more like $100. So you don't have to spend a ton of money to repel. The difference is I can ascend or I can climb with my Manrock Safeguard, whereas it's hard to climb with a figure eight. And that's why I use the Manrock Safeguard. Um, so the next big thing that everybody's going to want to know, I certainly did when I was editing your article. Okay. Greg's back on the ground. Oh, and by the way, before I get to this, you take your stick off, obviously you've already lowered, you lowered your bow, took all your gear off the tree, just like anybody else would. Everything's in your pack or whatever. You take your stick off and you just clip that to your saddle and that just hangs off your side while you rappel down, right? It does. So there's about three options you can do. One, <laughs> some people just toss their stick from 20, 25 foot up and let it hit the ground. I, I'm not a huge fan of that, but you could do that, right? I mean, it's all metal. There's nothing really that's going to break. but it's still, these things are expensive. So I'm, I'm not a huge fan of that. The second option is you could cradle it in your arm and just kind of hold on to it as you're repelling. Well, the third option is what I found better is one of the companies that I love. In fact, it's the saddle I wear is a company called TX5. It's a, it's a company, a, a, a personal owned business of a, 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 in Texas. And they, the guy, the owners has five kids. So it's TX5. But he came out with a system, it's called a quick draw hanger, where it's basically a buckle that, that goes around and loops around girth hitches on your saddle, one of the molly loops on your saddle. And then the, the other one, girth hitches or, or goes around on your on your one stick. And those two things, it's a male end and a female end. And so all you got to do is clip it into the male end on your saddle, the female end from your, for your, uh, or your one stick, and then it can just hang underneath you. And as I'm rappelling down, as I'm walking down, I'm usually at a, 35, 40, 45 degree angle, the stick can just hang down under me until I get until my feet hit the ground and then I unclip it and lay it off to the side. All right. Well, again, good, just good, interesting uh information. So you're that back on the ground. So back to where I, what I was gonna say. Uh so Greg's on the ground, all his stuff is on the ground, his rope's up there in the tree, and it's wrapped around, you know, the tree and through the loop. And how are you gonna get your how are you gonna get your rope out of the tree, brother? Well, hopefully you clipped your pull down rope on behind the scaffold knot before you lowered yourself to the ground. Otherwise, you're going back up in what we call affectionately the climb of shame. <laughs> and that's because you forgot to clip your pull down rope onto your main rappel rope. And your pull down rope is, for those who can't see the video or aren't watching the video, I reached back and grabbed a little piece of Dynaglide. And this is 40 foot of Dynaglide. It's, it, it folds up into the palm of my hand, literally can fit in the fist. I can wind it up in a fist and, and put everything inside of it. I have a little bitty carabiner that's rated to five kilonewtons. So that way, if you have to put some force on it to break your, your rope out of the tree, you don't destroy your little carabiner. I would not recommend the little, this is the same exact size as the carabiners you see in Walmart in the sporting goods section that cost 97 cents. And you find them in the camping section and everything else, don't use those. Order a good climbing rated carabiner and you clip that on to your rappel rope right behind your quick link that you that you run your rope back through. And when you hit the ground, 
you just throw throw this down before you rappel down. When you hit the ground, you take your one stick off, lay it in the ground, walk over there, take your take your whatever device you use to rappel with, your mad rock, your figure eight, whatever you use to rappel with, you need to undo that from your bridge and the rope so that your rappel rope is free and it doesn't have anything on it. Because what you're about to do is start pulling on the pull down rope. That's going to break the, the 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 loop up there wherever you were hunting at, and you're going to start pulling the rope down, and the tag end that's laying on the ground is start going, going to start feeding up through the through the quick length that you had your rope on, and so you can't have a mad rock or a figure eight or anything on that rope, or it won't pull down pull up through the uh, quick length. But you I mean, literally I, just pull it down. Everybody thinks one sticking is so scary, but really. I mean, it's scarier for your rope than anything else. Your poor rope has to go all the way up there, snaking up through the tree, and then it's going to come tumbling down to the ground after you pull it through. Yeah. And, you know, I, I actually, when, when I started looking at it and investigating, I'm like, well, what happens if there's a bunch of limbs up there? That was one of my big questions. Like, how does it, how does it, how do you get a rope out of the tree with limbs? Well, it's just going to, like, as you put it very succinctly, it's going to snake up through there through anything you climbed up. It's going to go through limbs, around limbs, over limbs, whatever, and you're just going to pull it right back through itself, and it's going to tumble back to the ground. So it, it's really easy. So what else, Greg, have I not asked you about? Now, we can't possibly cover everything because, like you said, there's – well, this is actually a good question, though. Because we can't cover everything, and, of course, people are going to want to see your article. and. You know, there's a whole series of photos that you provided with that. So right. people people can kind of see a visual representation of each step uh, in the process. They can obviously check out your YouTube channel to see video of you climbing, your boys climbing, uh, you know, gear info. But you mentioned several times, you know, forums and, and websites and things like that. What are some of the, the your favorite virtual hangouts, if you will, where do you go to share information and to hear from other people who you feel are, you know, experienced, reputable fellow saddle hunters and one stickers that have worthwhile knowledge to share with others? Yeah, so there's probably three predominant places on, on the web. Uh, there is a forum located at saddlehunter.com. And it's just a complete forum like you, like we grew up with 20, 25 years ago that we talked bow hunting and things like that. There's sub forums on different things, but it, that forum is located at saddlehunter.com. Uh, where most of us spend our time at these days, it seems like a lot, is on Facebook and groups in Facebook. And there's two big groups in Facebook uh, related to saddle hunting. Uh, saddle Hunter, if you just type in saddle space hunter. On Facebook in the search bar, it'll take you to that to that group. And, and the second one, and probably the biggest, and where I spend most of my time at, is Saddle Hunter Nation. So Saddle Hunter Nation, and uh, you'll if you search for my name in either one of those uh, one of those groups, you'll find out you'll see tons and tons and tons of posts uh, that I'm on daily making and contributing and trying to help people, and and likewise tons of other people likewise doing the same thing. Well, that's good, Greg. Um, I mean, we covered a lot today and, you know, I don't know about you, for me, you know, like I said at the beginning, just getting into a saddle, it wasn't an overnight thing. You know, you, I think you got to yeah. hear about it a bunch of times. You got to see it a few times. You got to have some buddies who, you know, are getting into it and you got to go through that whole you know, oh, I don't know, thought process. And, you know, it's the same thing with one sticking. And, and, and you know, you said it at the very beginning of the article that you put together. For me, you know, you you didn't necessarily think it was the greatest thing in the world the first time you, you saw somebody one stick. I did not. I, I, I think there's a lot of people, and, and it's easy to do, right? There's so much to talk about. There's so much minutia to, to dive into. It's easy to overcomplicate. I, I think if you strip away everything, you got to realize what we we hit upon. I think this has got to be the what comes through this podcast is that what I'm doing is not different than anyone that climbs with three or four sticks. I'm doing the exact same thing they are, with the only exception of I don't carry a second, third, or fourth stick. When I get to the top of my one stick, I reach down, grab it, 
move it up over my head and repeat the process. It's that simple. Exactly. And every time you repeat the process, that's what's called a move. Yep. And so two moves can get you, you know, 15, 16 foot high, three moves, you're at 21, 24 foot high. It, it, you can see how quick you can do and save, save time. I mean, I, I can get in a tree easily as, as fast as someone with a climber, especially when you consider they've got to take it off their back, disassemble it, wrap it around the tree, get the right angle, get in it, start climbing. By the time they're, they're doing all that, I'm, I can be right there with them, if not beat them. And I certainly beat them on the way down when I'm rappelling down. Yeah, and like you said, that's the most fun part of the whole hunt. Well, unless you, unless you shoot a deer, right? Yeah, well, you know <laughs> what? I, so I was very fortunate enough. I got a pretty nice DIY public land buck the last hour of the last day of this last season, one sticking, of course. And uh, I can tell you from personal experience, there's nothing like watching your 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 broadhead slice through two lungs and hearing that deer crash about 40 yards off in the brush. He was just out of sight, packing up and bounding down in one bound. There's nothing like it. Man, I'm going to tell you, you've got me ready to leap across the hurdle. I got to tell you, all I have to do is just get uh, one of those belay devices, I guess, and a I need to get a 40 foot section of, of climbing rope and, and I'll be able to start. Oh, and I, you know, and I want to get one of those nice all in one sticks like you have too, but yeah, you know, I start practicing out here in the yard and go up and shoot a few arrows and rappel down. Right. And repeat the process. Well, you know, you and I, I think we spoke on the phone last month and we were talking about, you know, possibly getting together for an elk camp sometime in the future. And I, this year is definitely going on with me the next time I go elk hunting because five pounds a year, literally that's all, all this is, is five, five, six pounds a year can go on my back. I can hike all across the mountain. And whenever I find hot sign, a wallow that I want to sit over, I can be up in an Aspen 20, 25 foot in eight, nine, 10 minutes. And I mean, what an advantage to be able to see way out through there, see whatever's coming to the wallow. Because you're up 20, 25 foot, and you're only carrying around five extra pounds that day while you're hiking around the Colorado mountainside. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, it's, it's, yep. And, and and the last thing, I meant to mention this at the beginning, but we'll close with it. I mean, if again, if you're watching the video, you can see that Greg and I are a couple of good-looking guys. But <laughs> hey, we're not as young as we used to be. I I don't know how you, old you are, Greg. I, I'm 49. I'll be 50 this fall. Uh, I got, I'm going to a few years on you. So you're in your 50s. Um, yeah. You know, we're both fortunate, right? We're relatively healthy guys, relatively able-bodied, you know, for a couple of middle-aged dudes. But yeah. neither one of us is going to get confused for, you know, the guy who needs directions to the bodybuilding convention. Um, yeah. You do not have to be a Cameron Haynes or anything close to a specimen like that to successfully one stick and enjoy the benefits of, you know, this style of hunting. One of my favorite sayings that I, I say it often is there is zero calorie burn if you're doing this correctly. Literally, it, I'm not doing any, I'm not adding any extra calorie burn than someone who's climbing sticks. Because I'm climbing to the top of the stick. If you're climbing sticks, you're doing the same thing I'm doing. The only difference is I literally allow myself to hang, twist, and pivot, grab a stick, and pull it up. That's the only difference. There's not much calorie burn in reaching down behind, below you and grabbing a stick and pulling it up, pulling it up to you. I mean, half a calorie, maybe. I don't know. You don't have. You don't have to be. You don't have to be in very good shape to do that. No, it would be, you know, I mean, it would be nice if it did burn a few more calories because we'd be we'd be a little bit thinner. You know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah. yeah. Um. So. So anyway, I just kind of wanted to, to mention that before we wrapped up, because you don't have to be you know, you don't have to be intimidated that it requires some sort of a superior physical effort or cardio or something like that. Like Greg said, it's basically if you can walk in the woods with a set of sticks and put those up then there's no reason that you can't one stick. Absolutely. I agree with that. So 
buddy, I tell you what, I think that was one of our best episodes ever because I can't I can't think of, you know, another conversation that was probably as packed with really good information from start to finish. Uh, there, there's a lot of information around it. And, you know, one of these days, we'll maybe maybe the next time we'll get away from the gear so much and we'll talk about the why, because because the why is, is a pretty big deal about that. And I touched on that article I wrote for you last month uh, that's coming out in July a little bit in the, the last paragraph. But but the why of one sticking is, is probably another good conversation we could have. Well, we can do that in the very near future. I think that's a good tease for our next time together. Sounds good. All right, man. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I uh, wish you continued success with the YouTube channel and your writing endeavors. And most of all, uh, with your family and your time together with your boys out there in the Whitetail Woods. That's the most important thing. Thanks, Christian. Thanks for downloading the Peterson's Bow Hunting Podcast. All bow hunting, all the time. Pick up the latest issue of Peterson's Bow Hunting Magazine on your local newsstand. Or connect with us online at bowhuntingmag.com.